Hey CIT 100 students, welcome back to week two of our online learning course about computer fundamentals. We did some cool stuff last week around component diagrams, both of non-computer systems and computer systems. In this introductory video, I'd like to take a peek at what we did last week, give you some feedback on areas where we were successful and areas in which we can continue to learn, and then I'll give you a brief layout of our week on operating system exploration. Then there'll be three videos for the, each of three activities or exercises that are contained in our operating system module. So without further ado, I'd like to pull up the screen from last week's work and take a peek at some of the cool stuff we were up to. So one of the neat things about our online course and the way that it's put together is you have a chance to see each other's work. You can build on what other students are working on, you can learn from them, and hopefully even contribute in a collaborative way as our course goes on. So as I mentioned, because we're uploading to a shared drive, we are able to download other people's work and see it. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm here on Technology Rediscovery Home, and this, uh, let's scroll back up to week one and we can pull up our shared uh, directory of student submissions. And I had a chance to peek through these and I think they're pretty cool. So I've selected a few that give us a variety of types of feedback or types of work that students have done. Please don't feel bad if I didn't pull yours up. You'll get a chance. And I'd like to start with Karen. And this is Karen's document. Karen diagrammed a, uh, an awesome KitchenAid mixer. And I'm not much of a cook, but I've lived enough with cooks to realize that KitchenAids are considered awesome. They cost about four times as much as a regular mixer, and they are sturdy. And if we look at Karen's diagram, we can see the components that she put in her diagram. We have an AC motor, which is awesome. That's alternating current. That means it's got enough oomph to really stir some dough. She gave us a power cord, and we have a worm gear, which is a, uh, a great technical term for the mechanical device inside the mixer that transfers the force from the AC motor up and then across that arm and down to swirl the stuff in the bowl. We've got a transfer gear that moves over to another transfer gear and then down to the beater. This is a great system. It's not a computer, but it has components. It works together to mix stuff. So nice work, Karen. Let's take a peek at Karen's computer diagram. Karen did a great job of putting in a lot of different components for our computer system. And we're actually going to, uh, I'm going to pass on Karen's computer diagram because right now it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, we'll come back to it. Um, here's Austin. Austin is interested in photography, presumably. And Austin decided to diagram a camera. Let's see what components his camera has in it. We have a camera body and we've got a lens and a shutter button. I like this diagram because cameras have lots of buttons on them. At least uh, the digital SLR cameras have lots of buttons on them. But the most important components really are the lens, the shutter button, and as he's labeled, the light sensor. And so as we can see, a system diagram doesn't have to be exhaustive. A system diagram has to be detailed enough for the particular purpose. And in this case, the purpose was to bring out this idea of components having individual roles that connect. We can see that figure two that Austin gave us is an internal view inside the camera. We have a viewfinder mirror. We can see that the mirror is diagonal because the mirror actually uh, flips up when the photographic element is being exposed and then drops down. That's so that your viewfinder can actually look through the lens of the camera itself. The light sensor is at the back behind the mirror. And we even have a nice diagram in figure three about the movement of that data from the light sensor into the SD card. So that's super cool. That's great. Let's take a peek at Austin's computer diagram. And Austin did a nice job with sticky notes and has a bunch going on here. And let's dissect that a little bit. So I just did some zooming action. And so Austin has our core components. We've got a processor. It does all of the 
uh, calculations to keep the com to allow the computer to do what to calculations to tell the computer what to do, uh, which is right. We might say that it it uh, it is the processor of the computer. We've got the RAM, and it's a temporary storage device for what the PC is working on. That's exactly right. So it's important as we work through our computer diagrams to realize that the motherboard itself contains a bunch of different parts. The most important are the CPU and the RAM. And the reason these have to go together is because the CPU just does calculations. It's kind of like these older calculators that you type in a set of digits, you give it an operation, you give it another set of digits, and it spits out the answer. Now you can save with memory maybe one or two answers, but really the job of the calculator is to display the answer, and it's up to the user to record that somehow and come up with an overall answer. Similarly, the CPU we could think of as the component that only does math. The RAM has to provide the CPU with the problems or the instructions that it needs to process. The CPU does the crunching, it gives it back to the RAM, and the RAM stores it. In fact, the CPU is, is very smart, and so not only is it giving the results back to the RAM, but it actually gives instructions to the RAM of what information it needs next. So the RAM is kind of like a staging ground for passing and receiving information from the CPU. So these have to be matched in speed. You can have a lickety split CPU, but if the RAM is not designed to give and receive data at the speed the processor can undertake those operations, we have a bottleneck. And so we will have speed of the CPU wasted because the RAM isn't fast enough. And so over time, these of course have gone up together. So now we have very fast RAM and we have very fast CPUs. So nice job. We've got that depicted nicely on here. I like the way that the hard drive has to and from arrows coming from the CPU and the RAM. We could make one little addition by labeling that flow. So we would say digital information is flowing to and from the hard drive. And I think we, he's probably getting there with the color of the arrows. And so I'm sure he's done that thinking and maybe it just didn't make it into the diagram. Because I see that the power supply has flows going onto the motherboard. We would want to connect the power supply up to every other component because every digital component in a computer requires some power from that power supply. We have an output going to the speaker, which is fantastic. I like the way that the speaker is located on the outside of the overall computer case. So that's fantastic. We are certainly getting the idea here. An input device of the keyboard connects up to the case through a port. And we might connect that diagram up to the motherboard, uh, or that line up to the motherboard, because ultimately the port on the back of the computer that you plug the uh, keyboard into is the motherboard most of the time. So nice work Austin, keep it up. Malisha had a really cool non-computer system. I wonder if Malisha is in civil engineering or perhaps chemistry because Malisha decided to diagram a system at a very different scale than say a digital camera or a mixer. She diagrammed an entire water treatment plant this is cool because it helps bring out this idea that the concept of a system works at many different levels, all the way down to the system within the CPU. There are miniature components inside the CPU that work together to make this component, and then those are built up. So in other words, a computer system, just like a water treatment plant, could be considered a system of systems. So let's see what Malisha told us and taught us about how the water treatment plant is structured. So we begin with the water source. I love it. We have a pipe, and I can see from the waves that that's water flowing through that pipe. It goes from the source, and she gave us a lot of key details. Again, not unnecessary. The fact that there's a screen to protect wildlife and to keep out debris is critical. The entire system would get uh, all gummed up and probably destroyed in a hurry if it weren't for the, the screen device on the intake. That's my guess. We can see that it goes through a rainwater pump station, so we are adding water in the input. And then we finally make it over to the water treatment plant. So we have chemical vats that are dropping uh, chemicals in for pretreatment. She mentions chlorine, and that helps kill bacteria and viruses. 
She mentions the idea of a coagulation tank, and that is, I'm having difficulty getting down to uh, reading that, but that's okay. We've got, um, they bind to form larger particles. So I think what that's doing is we have the pretreatment, and then coagulation means clumping. So there's a step in there that involves clumping together impurities so they can be filtered out on the next step. This is so good. This is really great. So we have uh, filtration going on here. The clean tap water passes through the filter made of sand, gravel, and charcoal. Excellent. So we're not only getting the name of the component, but also some of its inner workings. And backwashes are done to clean the waste from the filters. That's interesting. And then there's a post-disinfection addition of um, chlorine. And then we go to a finished water holding tank, which goes through the water lines to the distribution system. That's amazing. So as we could uh, follow our, our thread here, each one of these particular big components, like the filtration component, no doubt has many smaller little components. Even a valve that controls water flow into and out of the filter is itself a component that has you know, handles and fixtures and bearings and gaskets. So uh, this is the idea of engineering. And computer engineering is like a lot of other engineering fields, which is by thinking about them in terms of components, we can isolate them. And often engineers will specialize in one particular type of component. And they specialize in that type. Other engineers specialize specialize in their field, and if they talk and work together enough, those can work together to make a pretty amazing system. Let's look at Malisha's computer diagram, which I'll bet is of the same high quality as the non-computer diagram. So we've got a motherboard, we've got power supply. I love how Malisha's power supply has outgoing arrows to lots of other components, fans, hard drive, video card, motherboard. Notice the directional arrows there are accurate. Power supplies only ship out power. They aren't receiving any information. They aren't receiving any power from the components. So those are excellent. Now the motherboard has a to and from diagram or to and from error with the CPU, um, which is almost there. We might say that the motherboard is actually the container or the support device for the CPU. I happen to have a motherboard right here. So we can see that the motherboard is a, is a connecting component. Uh, I know it's kind of far away, but you uh, get the idea if you looked closely on the back that there are lots of little lines and wires, or lines that are wires, that connect the components on the top side of our motherboard. So one little adjustment we could make is just drawing a bigger line around the CPU and the RAM, and the signals technically would be going from the CPU down to the motherboard, up to the RAM, and back. So again, the purpose of this exercise is not to nitpick the diagrams, but to think conceptually about how the components are related. So we've got the CPU uh, working together with the RAM, which is excellent. We'd want to get a back arrow between the RAM and the CPU. Um, I guess it goes through the motherboard, so that's perfect. And then the hard drive. So we've got a really good uh, component diagram here. So nice job, Malisha. Let's just do a couple more. We have Chrissy, who diagrammed a microwave oven. Excellent. That's one of those quasi-computer components that uh, microwave ovens today usually have a digital interface, and they, in fact, have an embedded computer. They're called embedded systems inside of them. And that is responsible for processing the simple commands, like start, increase time, stop, defrost, those kinds of things. Again, that's the difference between a digital camera, and we put a microwave in the category with that camera, and a computer, and that the processor inside the microwave is not a multi-purpose processor. It's not like the CPU with the RAM. It's designed for running only in microwaves. And so we have different components here, rotating plate, light, clock timer, electric outlet, plug, air vent. These are fantastic. We might 
improve this diagram by adding some of the connecting components. So we might want to see that the clock and the timer controls the power to the actual microwave generating element, which is what generates these magic waves that heats up uh, things in the microwave. So this is a, a, a great start. And let's look at our computer system. Chrissy did a nice job of laying these out. We've got hard drive, input devices, power supply gives power to the input devices, and those input devices feed into, we've got a line going to the hard drive. We might try again to have our motherboard be a container for several components. And then we would say something like, our hard drive is not on the motherboard. It exists outside the motherboard and would be connected to a port on the motherboard called a SATA port. I wasn't expecting you to know SATA ports. SATA gives and receives information and then the SATA is routed to the RAM and the RAM can send data back to the SATA port through to the hard drive. So there's some clarification there. We have strong definitions, however. This is great. Let's take a peek at what Chrissy said about the, uh, the shared components. Uh, a common item between the diagrams would be the power supply. Yes, perfect. They both need power. Uh, demand is entered into the keypad of the microwave, just like a keypad on a computer. This is the idea. We have systems that do... Whoa! Sorry, hold on. Whew. Whew. That'll wake you right up. <laughs> That's actually my alarm clock. I beg your pardon. Okay, you don't want to know what time it is. So let's keep go <laughs> let's keep going with Chrissy. Uh, so we both have uh, most systems have some sort of input device. The unique item between the two diagrams would be input and output. Both these devices would not be separate part of the casing. In a microwave, the input of the data and the output of the requested information are all in the microwave. Could even say the microwave board would encompass all the components, just not the internal components. That's great. So the way that they're designed, one is more modular than the other. So uh, a common desktop computer does have its components uh, in separate casings, uh, which is cool. Uh, we've got a, uh, Nia has a diagram for us. And we have a diagram of a plant. This is great. Uh, it's a non-computer and non-electronic system. This is in line with our segment four, which is about file system trees being inspired by real living trees. So this is cool. We have photosynthesis. We have sun energy and CO2 and H2O as input components. We have oxygen and glucose coming out. That's perfect. It gives us a high-level view of what's going on in photosynthesis. Excellent job. And then our computer diagram, we have output. We have arrows going to printer and monitor. We could label those output devices. So we'd say um, visual display signals go out to the monitor, and uh, printing instructions go to the printer. CPU RAM is on our uh, motherboard. I would separate out that hard drive uh, and hard disk drive and hard drive would be the same. So those uh, probably could be uh, combined. And then we have inputs from the mouse and the keyboard. So that's perfect. We have inputs, processing, and outputs. Nice job. All right, and we've got some nice uh, um, a key there. So nice work on week one. Keep up the high quality work. And I want to step back and apologize for some of my videos being a little bit late. We can work together on this in that uh, just like I sometimes fudge my beginning times a bit, I'm not super strict about exactly getting something in by midnight on Saturday. I do my best to work most of the day on Sunday. Sometimes it spills over to Monday. What's important is that you find regular time to work on it. And exactly when you do the upload is of much less importance to me than are you finding quality time to do some things. I would rather you push back when you submit by a day if it means you can do it in peace and calm so that you can provide your brain the focus that it needs to do it. So before I finish up this segment, let's take a peek at week two. So again, our home page for this course is our weekly lesson guide. And I have a link here to jump down to current week. And this week's 
exploration is operating systems, which is a software, meaning a set of uh, programs or instructions that communicates with the hardware and then applications that we run that actually do things that are of interest to us as users. So you'll see that I've given you learning objectives. Our essential resources this week is also a Wikipedia article. And I spent some time uh, digesting this, as I hope you will. And the reason I chose this is because it's very thorough at providing you both a component by component discussion of the operating system as well as examples of the leading operating systems that you probably are familiar with as well as those that you aren't. So please take about 15 minutes and read at least the headers and the first paragraphs of those sections in the Wikipedia article. And then the lesson sequence is straightforward. I have a link to this video and you'll make a word processing document like last week. Use your first name and that special ID number. The lesson sequence item three is a link to what I call a module guide, which is where I put in the actual learning components and exercises for this module. Now, or for this week, excuse me. So the reason I don't just put it directly in the weekly guide is the module is kind of like the textbook. And the weekly guide gives us our class's specific instructions. Do this module, upload your responses here. I use the modules for several classes. They also exist online as a general resource for folks. So that's why I direct you to the module page instead of embedding all of that material in our weekly guide. This is organized by section. I give you an overview of operating system as a whole, and then I'll walk you through each of three exercises. I have a video to go with each exercise, and I'll invite you to probably anticipate about two hours or so to work through these exercises, and you'll document your learning in that word processing document and upload it to our server uh, this coming weekend. So once again, it's great working with you on this course. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to call our helpline. 412-894-3020. That's the landline to the shop here. You can also send uh, tiny questions to me uh, via email. But please limit uh, conceptual questions or questions that I can't answer in one reply to phone calls, and that will help speed the, uh, speed the communication. So with that, enjoy operating systems, and I will catch you on segment number two.